Hello everyone, welcome and thank you for joining Alpha Biotech's webinar on the topic Minimal Invasive Implantology, Immediate Placement, Partial Extraction Therapy and Dual Zone Immediate Temporary Station. Today we are joined by a special guest, international speaker Dr. Attila Bodrogi from Hungary. Uh, it's an honor to have Dr. Bodrogi here, a specialist in implantology. He owns a private practice in the city of Budapest. So thank you very much, Dr. Bodrogi, for joining us today. Um, I would like to tell everyone that if you have any questions, you can uh, write them on the chat. Feel free to write them and we will answer them at the end of the session. Uh, I will inform you that we will be recording this webinar for educational purposes. So please, everyone, kindly mute your microphones during the session so we can hear the speaker. And uh, now, Dr. Bodrogi, you may start. Thank you so much. Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you, Daniela, for this kind introduction. You know, it's pretty strange because I'm sitting in front of my computer and just can check my screen and know any interaction with the uh, participants. So hopefully you can enjoy this presentation. You can see me, you can clear me, uh, uh, hear me. If you have any concern, just write a comment and Daniela will organize it. So the today's topic is minimal invasive implantology. But as a surprise, I'm originally a prosthodontist. I'm dealing with uh, smile makeovers and full mouth reconstructions. But in the past, I would say 10 years, I focused my attention and intervention to implant dentistry, uh, utilizing the final restorations as well. So I will focus on minimal invasive procedures, but I will uh, keep your attention on the prosthetic solutions as well. I've been lecturing internationally for six, seven years. I'm speaking sometimes for the company Alpha Biotech and speaking for uh, Dental XP. But I started my speaker career in 2005, so it was some 15 years ago. Last year, we established a, an education project focusing on aesthetic and implant dentistry, and we tried to teach our doctors how to take high quality uh, photography. Because as you know, or you may notice, I communicate through my images with my patients, with my staff, with my lab technician, and I collect these images for presentation purposes. Sometimes we give, uh, I would say, live surgeries, live treatments in my office. But actually, we have quite complex training projects with cooperation with Dental XP. We focus on the aesthetics. It involves four different levels, four modules, and we have eight modules in implant dentistry and surgery. But actually, I think the maybe the most important part of the education is hands on. In this picture, I show you my little daughter uh, who tried to shape natural dentition on a pumpkin. But in real life, in real hands on courses, our uh, doctors enjoy the most of this part of the uh, educational project. But as in the introduction, you realized, you heard that I'm from Budapest, Hungary. My office located right here at the side of the House of the Parliament. And I have a new department. Actually, we have six chairs and I can focus my personal intervention to smile makeovers, full mouth reconstructions and the implant placement. And of course, we have to combine them in certain situations for different patients. So it's a multidisciplinary office. 
I'm lucky that I can deal with high demand, high expectation patients. They sometimes very critical. This is why I have to focus on the tiny details. So finally, when we finish a treatment, sometimes after a few months or one, one and a half years uh, in different situations, these are the end results that our uh, customers or patients require. And this is why we have to think when start a treatment. Just imagine what if these patients come to the office. We have, of course, some concern. We realize we detect some uh, discrepancies regarding the occlusion, the aesthetics. We have missing canine on the left side. So we plan, uh, we design our final outcome. And this is how we can provide our patients with a really nice and fitting final restoration. So my approach is, I would say, tissue responsible dentistry. It involves some contemporary concepts in hard and soft tissue management in implant dentistry. And as I mentioned, focus on the restorative procedures too. So this is how I imagine uh, tissue responsible dentistry. So we focus on not only the implant placement, we focus on the tissue management, the fine restoration and the function. So as Dr. or Professor Brunemark said, surgery is not just cutting, but the gentle handling of Mother Nature's gift. So I have two hobbies, which is my profession and my family. I have four kids and I love challenges. I challenge myself in the sport life. I love challenges on the podium and I challenge myself in the office in both procedures. But actually, uh, it's an actuality of the current situation. We have to challenge ourselves just varying the protection equipment. But back to implant dentistry, you know what is the biggest challenge for me? Yes, it's bone loss. And this is the same challenge for the patients. Why? Because bone substitution, GBR, requires most of the time multiple surgeries. Sometimes it comes with pain and discomfort and takes more extra cost and time. So just imagine if it's an implant site with these two adjacent missing teeth, how can we reconstruct the site? This is the missing, the lost tissue volume. So if we try to understand the biology of the extraction site, we have three different types of extraction sockets, especially in the anterior dent dentition. The type one, we have an intact socket with intact cortical plate and soft tissue. The type two, we have a dehiscence buccally uh, in the bony structures, but the soft tissue is present. And the type three is both hard and soft tissue is missing. Actually, there are uh, sub classifications of the type two uh, regarding the amount of this uh, tissue lost. But let me show you an example how a completely missing cortical plate looks like. So it's a hopeless tooth and the CBCT, we can clearly check that in front of the root surface, there is no cortical plate at all. So when I remove the tooth, we have a uh, quite sufficient amount of soft tissue, but I was sure that I have to elevate the flap. And yes, this is the clinical situation. The buccal plate is completely missing. What can be done in these situations? We have very clear and nicely detailed recommendations from the literature. This specific case belongs to the severe uh, degr tissue degradation. So we have to wait after the GBR seven to 10 months. We have to distinguish between the timing of implant placement, which can be immediate, early or late. 
as described in the uh, ITI treatment guide by Daniel Boozer. So we talk about immediate implant placement when we can place our implant at the same day when we extract the tubes. Early placement with soft tissue healing. Uh, it takes four to eight weeks after an extraction when we return back and try to place an implant. Early placement with partial bone healing after three uh, months to four months. Most of the time it requires the GBR as a side treatment of the implant placement. And if we are able only after six or more time, six months or more time after the extraction, we consider it a late implant placement. So we have recommendations for each type. We have a kind of difficulty level recommendation. It can be an easy, advanced or complex category. But back to this case, I did my GBR with flap elevation. I utilized allograft and covered it PRF and these are just the situation of the, the stitch uh, utilization. So we waited eight months and the upper corner you see the CBCT, it's a totally healed ridge. We have a quite nice papillae due to the fact that I utilized a slight pontic design for my temporary. And when I placed my implant with a micro flap, and I took the impression for the temporary, and this is how it heals. So it was an immediate temporary. We start in here with the severely destroyed buccal cortical plate, and this is how we ended up. And this is submergence profile created just the temporary. And it's very important to understand whenever it's possible, we should utilize temporaries on our implants. So this was my CAT cam immediate temporary, and as we were satisfied with its shape and the tissue uh, contouring effect, we just copy paste it, and this is the CAT cam hybrid crown. These are the restoration that I utilize most of the time. I would say 99 or more percentage of my cases are restored with screw detained one piece solutions. So when we check from occlusal view, we can clearly see that there is no dimension change at all in comparison with the adjacent natural dentition. The final restoration screw detained and exactly identical on both sides. But in order to understand the concept of minimal invasive implantology, we have to understand the biology behind the extractions. So this is the normal, the natural healing pattern of the uh, extraction side, especially in the anterior, upper and lower dentition, as we have very thin cortical plates are covering our root surfaces. So this is the process of the bone resorption, and we have to understand that the more time we waste after the extraction, the more tissue will be lost. From the literature and from our own experiences, we know that the cortical plate is most of the time very thin. It can be thinner than one millimeter. So we can imagine what if we extract a tooth? What happens with that very thin cortical plate? So I think we can announce it's all about the blood supply. And from the biology, we know that the cortical plate receives the blood supply from two directions. From inside the periodontal ligaments, from outside the periosteum, uh, covers the cortical plate and they deliver the blood supply. So what if we remove a tooth entirely, we remove the periodontal ligaments and the blood supplies, the blood vessels at the same time. So we don't have periodontal ligaments, we have only cortical uh, bone, no bone marrow, 
and only the periosteum can deliver uh, the blood supply. This is why it's very important not to raise a flap buccally whenever it's possible. So we have to understand whenever we lose a tooth, we will lose the bone. And uh, the question, can we decrease or avoid bone loss? The option A, I would say immediate implant placement at the time uh, when we extract the tooth. We understand and we know that there is a certain way of placing an implant into the extraction socket. First, we have to hit the palatal wall, not at the angulation of the apex, the palatal wall, then keep following your osteotomy, turn in a correct prosthetically driven position, keep going, keep following step by step with the osteotomy drills, and finally you can place your implant apically and palatally from the extraction side. This is the way we can uh, deliver a jumping distance of let's say two to four millimeter between the cortical plate and the implant surface and it's very important of course we need a very good implant system with a good primary stability a good a good example can be the neo system from the alpha biotech but let me show you a case a very simple a very easy case but we have to manage the patient and the procedure properly. We have to diagnose and we have to uh, execute our treatment very precisely. So we have this initial situation. The left lateral uh, is in problem. We checked on the CBCT. We have cortical plate, so it's intact in front of the tooth. So very careful extraction is utilized. I collected some bone chips from the osteotomy and placed the implant in a proper palatal position. I checked, I always measure the primary stability. I would say I am an ISQ guy, so I always measure the primary stability. And if it's something around 70 or above, I'm happy and I'm relaxed that I can temporize it. We have to understand there's a difference between immediate temporization and immediate loading. In anterior and dentition for single tooth uh, implant placement, I try to avoid as much as I can uh, the immediate loading. So I just temporize. I will explain a little bit later what is dual zone uh, prosthetic concept. But now I took the impression after measuring the ISQ and I put some bone graft into the gap. I utilized the PRF membrane and I waited, let's say, 24 hours and my lab partner delivered the screw retained uh, temporary on my implant. I shade a little bit because it's very important to have a nice concave, I would say the S shape profile of the uh, prosthetic solution. And I placed it. So it, I would say it's the same day temporary as I placed it in 24 hours after the operation. I let it heal, but from occlusally, we can check that there's uh, dehiscence on the buckle. We checked on the CBCT that the cortical plate is OK, but that was the time uh, if we get familiar with the concept of the zero bone loss. It shows from the Linkovich study that the thicker tissue, I mean soft tissue, thicker soft tissue, prevents more the tissue loss, the bone loss. This is why I just prepped a delicate pouch in front of the cortical plate. I harvested a connective tissue graft from the palate. It's like a tsukale type connective tissue and just pulled it into that pouch. I secured it only one stitches and after three weeks there's a change. I changed the environment of the cortical plate and the implant. So this is the six uh, three weeks of healing. Just look at the dimension change on the right hand side before I would say at the time of the implant placement and the upper, the bigger image shows you 
the tissue profile after adding the cortical uh, connective tissue. The cortical plate is clearly visible on the uh, control CBCT, and I would say it's a minimal invasive procedure, so implant dentistry can be fun for the patient. So there's no pain, no swelling, no stitches, so it's quite easy and predictable. And the biggest advantage, it's a kind of one surgery, one time approach. So I told you there's a dual zone therapy or dual zone concept is a very, um, very good way to prevent further tissue loss. I would say uh, both soft and uh, hard tissue loss after placing an implant. There's a multi-center study. They divided the patients into four groups. The group one, which is on the left side, they just place an implant with a healing abutment. The group two, this is the second one, they placed implant, don't put any bone graft into the jumping distance, just placing a temporary immediately on the implant. The group three, they placed bone grafting without immediate temporary. And in group four, they put bone filler material and an immediate temporary. And the study shows that the very clear and exact winner is the group four when they utilize the bone filler into the gap and utilize an immediate temporary. Why? Because this temporary provides a proper closure of the implant site. They provide uh, stabilizing the blood clot and bone filler material provides nice, um, I would say, tissue scaffold. And this is the way that the newly formed bone surrounds the placed implant and the soft tissue is stabilized with the temporary. So this is the concept. And this is why, whenever possible, I utilize immediate temporary on my implants. So the study shows that we have less hard and soft tissue collapse and less recession when utilizing this dual zone concept. But my main concern, it shows that we have less recession, less collapse. But the question, how can we avoid tissue collapse at all. Is there any approach, any proved uh, treatment uh, to achieve this requirement? I start with the biology again. We have to preserve blood supply. We agreed that we have blood supply from the side of the periodontal ligaments, from inside and from the periosteum. So if we don't raise a flap, we can preserve the blood supply from the side of the periosteum. But how about the periodontal ligaments? And here comes the option B, but actually I would say it's my first choice whenever immediate placements comes um, to the planning of implant placement, especially in my uh, special practice. So my solution is partial extraction therapy. Actually, the PET consists of three different types of uh, procedures. The first one is socket shield, then pontic shield, and root submerged technique. The fourth one is a modification of socket shield for delayed approach. But let me explain how this approach looks like, what are the steps after each other, and I will show you many cases utilizing these uh, solutions, and you will clearly understand. I will tell you the pro and contraindications of this situation. So back to the past, I was on a road show some five years ago in South Africa, and one night we had a party together with Howie Gluckman, is a good friend of mine, and he introduced this new concept to me. I was shocked because never heard about it, but I was truly amazed uh, of the final outcome 
of the operation and the final outcome of the prosthetic solution. The concept is something similar like on this cross-section sketch, but let me explain. If we have a hopeless tooth that needs to be removed, no periapical lesion, no uh, periodontologic or pathologic any problem, then we remove only the coronal portion first. Then dissect the remaining root from mesial to distal, remove the palatal portion only, and leave a very thin, I would say one, one and a half, maybe two millimeters in thickness, the shield attached by the periodontal ligaments to the cortical plate. Then we place an implant in a palatal position, like in an immediate uh, implant placement procedure. We can fill up the gap and we can utilize an immediate temporary when the primary stability uh, let us do this. So the statement, we have to keep the good portion of the root, which is the uh, shield, and we lose the bad portion, which is the palatal portion, and then we can leave enough room, enough space for the implant to be placed properly. So this sketch again shows us the components of the socket shield. The number one is the shield, which is a root fragment shaped back to one and a half millimeter in thickness, and it's cut back to the crest level. Then we place an implant, which is number two. Nice to have an implant system with a good primary stability with platform switching solution. We utilize a nice S shape or under controlled prosthetic design for the uh, temporary, I would say. Then we can leave enough room for the soft tissue to heal properly and we'll cover uh, the cortical plate and the shield. And as I am a prosthodontist, I consider implant dentistry as a prosthodontic discipline. And of course, we have to utilize surgical components. So if you would ask why that is my first choice, I would say first, because it's very predictable. Two, it's reproducible. Three, it's the least invasive way of placing an implant and having amazing final outcome. So the science dated back to 2010 by Hürzler, but actually the number of the articles and studies increasing day by day. We have very uh, promising and proving uh, histologic evidences, histologic studies of the newly formed bone uh, between the shield and the implant surface. So. According to the science, according to the scientific proof, it's real bone, real newly formed bone and no connective or fibrous tissues between the implant and the shield. As I mentioned, there are different types of variations of the partial extraction therapy. But which is very important, especially for me, that there's a group of dental professionals. It's called the Dental XP, Dental XP uh, Pet Research Group. It consists of 19 uh, dental professionals, including myself. And uh, we have colleagues publishing books, like in this amazing book about partial extraction therapy, and other guys from this group are, are providing uh, studies, uh, providing literature and we have a very open conversation regarding uh, this approach. We try to take it as safe and as predictable as possible, utilized by other dental professionals. So as I mentioned, five years ago, <clears throat> I was introduced to partial extraction therapy, and I, when I returned back to my office on the next week, I met this patient. Actually, I placed these three implants. I'm not very happy with the final end results, 
uh, focusing on the anterior part because we have some missing tissues. But actually, the problem right now with the canine, I cannot restore it properly. I checked on the CBCT. There's two things which is visible. We have a very thin, almost invisible cortical plate in front of the root surface. And the second uh, consideration, we have a strange apical formation. It's like an ankylosed tooth. So it's pretty obvious. It's another example down there. If we remove a tooth like this, we will definitely end up with a very thin cortical plate or it might fracture during the extraction. So this is why I decided that in this situation, I don't remove the tooth entirely. I utilize partial extraction therapy. This was my first case. It's not perfect, not at all, but this was the first one. So we have different type of kits utilizing this approach. They help us to reach the apex properly. They help us to shape the shield properly. So this was my first case. I placed an implant. Actually, this implant system is not uh, a good candidate for immediate implant placement, but I could place it. But as you see, I didn't temporize. I made a bone filler with IPRF and covered it with APRF. Actually, I think it's a very uh, good and very useful approach to help us as uh, dental surgeons. Um, almost always I utilize the PRF uh, procedure for my surgeries. But after six months of placing the implant behind the shield, I checked on the uh, CBCT and on the right hand side you can check that there's a shield protecting my cortical plate. Uh, the implant is placed properly prosthetically, and this is my final restoration. On the occlusal view, it's clearly visible that we lost tissue, both hard and soft tissue, even with the immediate approach. Uh, posteriorly, with the first uh, bicuspid, I placed in a delayed approach, so it's a visible sign of tissue loss. But actually, the clear winner of this situation is partial extraction therapy. So this was my first case, but let me show you step by step how it looks. Hopeless tooth, hopeless canine again. Actually, most of the time, canine and anterior dentition is the best candidate utilizing the uh, socket shield approach. So I remove first the content of the canal, then I dissect it from mesial to distal, removed only the parietal portion up to the apex. Then I start shaping the shield. We have different burrs in the partial extraction therapy kit. They help us to make the shield thinner and cut back to the crest level. It's very important not to overcut, but the other option is the suprocrestal uh, shield position is another bad solution. So you have to focus on cut back your shield to the crest level. We have different um, burrs with markers, like in this picture. Now I make my osteotomy palatally, prosthetically driven, and just check. This is my implant position. I could leave a jumping distance, a gap between the implant surface and the, cord, uh, the shield. So it's a minimal invasive procedure. As you see, no bleeding at all. I just measure it immediately. It was above 70 on the ISQ scale, so I took my impression. Actually, sorry, in this case, I utilized the chair side temporary on my implant. First, I put some bone filler into the gap. I used the existing temporary, it's a PMMA temporary. I just modified it. 
a secluded tent immediate temporary. I utilize the titanium uh, temporary abutment. And this is how it heals. Just look at it. it's one week of healing. I utilize no stitches, no sutures, no swelling, no bleeding, no pain. So it's very stable tissue over time. But after six months utilizing the um, temporary, the shield in front of the implant and right side image, you can see the shield and the very thin cortical plate. Actually, this implant placement was just a part of a complex case, which is this one on this image. We have, as you see, multiple hopeless teeth. And this is what we got after just six weeks. So no tissue loss. I utilized different types of partial extraction therapy. I utilized this root submerged technique, a pantic shield, and two socket shields in this anterior dentition. On the left hand side, at the position of the uh, lateral, there's an old implant, but as you see, no tissue change, no volume change at all buccally. So this is just six weeks. It's an amazing approach, amazing, trust me. So if you would ask what are the indications and contraindications of socket shield, I would say as an indication, it's for immediate implant placement. Then the cortical plate is uh, very thin. Then you have ankylosed tooth and you can utilize it both anteriorly and posteriorly. And what are the contraindications? You cannot utilize it on periodontally involved tooth. Vertical root fracture and the missing cortical plate are contraindications. And if the shield got loose, then you try to extract only the palatal portion, it's a contraindication. You can remove the shield and uh, utilize the imme immediate implant placement or a delayed approach. But as an interesting thing, the periapical lesion can be okay. You can utilize a micro flap like a semilunar uh, flap. You can clean the apical uh, infection. You can place your implant when you have sufficient amount of bone to do that. But there are, I would say, they are not complications. They are those. Uh, phenomena that can occur during utilizing the um, partial extraction therapy. As I told you, if the loose buccal shield, if you have, uh, if your buccal shield got loose when you try to extract, you have to remove the shield. You can place your implant into the extraction socket or you can go delayed. But the most common complication is the shield exposure. This is why it's very important to have a screw retained uh, prosthetic solution. Because when you don't cut back your shield to the crest level and you don't leave enough room for the soft tissue to heal and cover it, or you don't take special attention to the S shaped design of your prosthetic solution, they can compress the soft tissue and it can happen a kind of shield exposure. But it's not a problem whenever you are able to remove your temporary without any flap elevation. You can cut back your shield to the crest level, put back your temporary, take special attention to the S shape profile, and it will heal properly. So as I told you, the best candidate should be the canine. Why? Because it has a very large prominence and very thin cortical plate most of most of the time. And in this special case, it's combined with a thin biotype, thin morphotype of the gingiva. So I removed only the palatal portion, and this is my osteotomy lingual enough from the uh, shield. And the CBCT after six months, you can check. The shield is clearly visible. I could leave enough room. We could 
uh, call it the prosthetic room between uh, the platform shifting design and the cortical plate. It provides us the blood supply and look at how it heals after 18 months when with the final restorations. No dimension change. It's very stable tissue over time. This is the most predictable approach for me uh, since I've heard this approach. So it's amazing. But as I told you, it's not only for anterior dentition. Let's say in this case, I utilized it for the first premolar. It's a fractured palatal wall. I removed the palatal uh, fragment in the palatal root. I shaped the shield, cut back to the crest level, placed an implant in a palatal position with an immediate temporary because I measured it and it was ready to temporize immediately. And look at the tissue healing after six months. Very thin, stable, keratinized, soft tissue, good implant position, final restoration, which is one piece, screwed it in zirconia crown. And if you check the initial and the upper image and the final and the lower image, no dimension change at all. And the CBCT, I always check the presence and the position of the shield. So the shield is clearly visible. It protects my cortical plate. Why? Because I didn't attach the periodontal ligaments and the blood supply between the periodont uh, the shield and the cortical plate is delivered through the periodontal ligaments. So this is not a magic. This is the biologic uh, consideration behind this approach. On the right hand side, we have an X-ray image. Now you can see the implant level. We have very nice uh, papillae on both sides. So this was a uh, socket shield, the first variation. The pontic shield can be considered as the second variation. I would explain it through another uh, case. This lady, very uh, nice lady, came to the office with this initial situation. Multiple teeth were restored with uh, PFM uh, crowns and bridges. We have a thin biotype with recessions, cervical recessions and the canine. But on the CBCT, now you can check that we have an apical problem with the right central. And we can check on the CBCT that the cortical plate is very thin. Now we can imagine and we understand if we remove the tooth entirely, this cortical plate will disappear in two to three weeks and it will end up in a horrible situation. So what I did here in this case, as the lady refused implant placement, so our plan is placing a three unit fixed partial bridge on the adjacent teeth, but I try to keep the cortical plate as much as I can. The solution is socket shield, but actually it's a modification. It's called the Pontic shield. So I did the, exactly the same. I removed only the palatal portion, but actually it's a C shape. Why C shape? Because I tried to support my papillae on both sides. This is why the shield end up uh, approximately on both sides. So I made the shield thinner, and this is how it healed with the temporary. I utilized the fixed temporary uh, solution. So this is the pontic side, and from the occlusal view, now we can check we have very nice papillae on both sides. So um, it's the proof of the final natural appearance. We have very stable uh, cortical facial tissues with thick, healthy soft tissue. This is the final uh, porcelain fused to zirconia three unit bridge. And this is how it heals when we insert properly. 
it looks like natural tubes. And in comparison with the initial situation, which is on the left side, the tissue level, we didn't lose any tissue. We just gained by adding connective tissue harvested from the palate and placed as a root coverage on the canines. On the occlusal view, no tissue, no dimension change at all. So this approach called the pontic shield. As we didn't place implant, we just utilized the shield to keep the cortical plate and we went for the uh, pontic design. So the third variation is root submerged technique. It may sound weird, but let me show you this case. This patient uh, has a long history in the office. It was um, 22 years ago when we first met, but three years ago when the patients came back with this situation, I was I was depressed. We have huge lesions, both uh, hard and soft tissues. So this teeth needs to be removed. But when I removed the right canine, now you can check the amount of missing bony structures. Even the adjacent implant, the threads of the implant is exposed. So it's not an easy situation. You cannot place an implant right here. So it, this site is a good candidate for GBR. So I utilize the sticky bone with IPRF. I utilize the lamina from Genos and covered with APRF membrane and closed it and let the site heal. So this is how the CBC image looked at the time when the patient entered for this treatment. And this is after six months, very nice and stable healing of the anterior lower dentition. So I just let those teeth uh, in order to support the provision of, for the healing of the patient. But if you check the dimension improvement of the tissues right here, now we can see that we gained a lot of tissue. On the left hand side, you can see the situation before implant placement after the GBR, after six months. So our plan is placing three implant and utilizing a five unit fixed screw detained bridge on those uh, three implants. So we have to place two implant in the GBR side. I will place an implant in the middle. It's an immediate uh, extraction site implant placement. But the interesting part is the root submerge because this tooth on the right in the middle is in good condition, but I don't want to mix a singular tooth with multiple implants. And prosthetically, this tooth is not very uh, promising. So I plan my implant position first. I place the implant, uh, two implants in the GBR site, one implant in the middle, which is immediate. Now you can see that the cortical plate is totally missing right here. So I have to utilize some more GBR. But the interesting part is the root submerge technique. RST stands for root submerge technique. So I cut back the tooth back to the uh, crest level as the implant position and the implant stability was good enough to utilize an immediate temporary. I took an impression. I covered the side with IPRF and this is my immediate lab made temporary PMMA excluded and restoration. So after uh, wearing this temporary for three months, this is the tissue profile, the tissue volume. So actually it was a combination of GBR, immediate implant placement and root submerge technique. From occlusal view, now we can uh, easily identify and check how the tissues respond to our procedures. On both sides, GBRs are okay. 
immediate implant placement, it's stable tissue, but it's obviously we lost some tissue. But the, the winner in this situation is the root submerged technique. Why? Because we left the root inside uh, the bony profile, we let the periodontal ligaments, then we didn't lose any uh, tissue buckle. Final restoration on three implants, crude retained zirconia, very nice and stable tissue profile. But if you compare the final situation on the right to the situation on the left, which is the initial after the extraction, uh, it's a very uh, promising and very stable and very nice result. We gained a lot of tissue. We have a nice and stable temporary, which is cleansable and stable over time. Let me show you a very nice and very easy way uh, to utilize a socket shield again. As I told you, I'm a specialist on aesthetics combining with implant placement. So most of the patients are coming uh, to restore their dentition after, let's say, like in this case, after an emergency with implant placement and sometimes a single uh, implant restoration. So I made this case last year. These patients came, it was a kind of splinting because the right central was fractured due to an accident. Always start with CBCT uh, imaging. We see multiple fracture lines, but more importantly, we can check the tissue, I mean, say, um, the uh, alveolus profile where we need to place an implant. Actually, there's a new classification according to the radial plane tooth position. And if we compare our situation on the left to the sketch on the right, we can clearly identify that this case belongs to the class B. And to be honest, we are lucky that we have plenty of bone, both apically and palatally from the existing root. So if we try to imagine the proper implant position, now you can see it can be placed easily. It can be um, a scrutin solution. So it's a kind of prosthetically driven implant placement. But how about the cortical plate? So it's a very thin biotype patient, like in this occlusal image, you can all see that it's a challenging case otherwise. So what I did, dissected the root itself from mesial to distal, gently removed the palatal portion up to the apex. Now we have this situation. In the next step, I will shape the shield. I will make it thinner and I will cut back to crest level and I have to manage the implant position as palatal as possible. So this is the ideal implant position. I made my osteotomy. I shaped the shield with this marking drill. I cut back to the crest level and I place my implant immediately into the extraction socket. This is the position of the implant as palatal as possible. Why? Because I try to leave a space of, let's say, one, one and a half millimeter between the implant surface and the shield. I measure as usual. It was above 70 again. This is why it's important to have an implant that has a very good primary stability. This is how we started. And this is how we finished. It's the one week follow up of the implant placement. No bleeding, no stitches, no swelling and no pain. After varying the temporary for six months, it's time to finalize the case. So I removed the temporary. I took this image immediately after removal and just Please check the dimension from a uh, from an occlusal view. 
exactly the same tissue volume in comparison with the adjacent teeth. Why? Because I left a small portion of the tooth of the root, which is called the shield. It's attached by periodontal ligaments to the cortical plate. This delivers the blood supply from inside. I didn't raise any flap, so the blood supplies come from outside as well. And this is the key. This is the proof of having uh, quite stable uh, tissue volume over time. So it's one surgery one time, so it's the least invasive procedure of all. This is my final prosthetic solution, screw retained tissue profile, the final restoration before final insertion, and this is when it's in the final position. Just look at the tissues, and these are the benefits. So I utilized no incision, no sutures, there was no bleeding, consequently no swelling, there was no pain, and maybe more importantly, there was no tissue loss at all. As I promised, there's a fourth variation, which is, I would say, the Glocker technique. It's a delayed approach. On the X-ray image, we can see a huge lesion is the left lateral upper arch, root canal hopeless, so definitely hopeless. Just try to imagine what if you remove the tooth, what will happen with that site? Will there be easy to place an implant after a healing period of, let's say, four to six months, even if you utilize GBR? I would say it's not an easy approach. So what can be done in this situation? So I considered uh, partial extraction therapy, but on the CBCT it was totally clear that I will be not able to place an implant immediately. Why? Because it's a very infected site and we have a huge lesion. I will show you what I found after removing only the palatal portion. So I don't say it's for, for beginners. So you have to be very gentle. You have to remove only the palatal portion after the apex. On the left-hand side image, you can see it. And I could remove totally the content of this infection. I cleaned it, disinfected it, and put bone filler material so in this situation, the membrane was not a resorbable membrane or a non-resorbable membrane. My membrane from the, uh, the buccal side is the cortical plate. So I utilized it covered with PRF and closed it. I didn't put uh, an implant temporary as I didn't place implant. So it was a conventional temporary. Sorry for that. Wow. Sorry, sorry for this delay. It's fine, no problem. OK, so this is the four months of healing, utilizing a temporary with a slight pontic design. I don't know why it quits. So if we compare the initial situation to the, I would say, the final or the after situation, now you can see that there is no any dimension change at all. So the case now ready to place an implant. On the left, uh, CBCT image, you can see the shield, you can see the newly formed bone, no fibrous tissues. It's, I don't have histologic studies in this case, but it's, I'm pretty sure it's newly formed bone. On the right hand side image, you can see the shield, it's clearly visible, and it's like stuffed 
it's filled up with newly formed bone, so the place is ready to place an implant. Due to this COVID situation, I was not able to uh, treat these patients, but hopefully in the next few weeks, I will meet him and place an implant, and I will give you an update whenever it's possible. So these are the shield positions on both images. And here comes the final uh, consideration, a final case. I think it takes just some 15 minutes. So if you are OK with this uh, extended uh, approach, I will keep going, keep following. So. If we talk about minimal invasive procedures, what else can be done to minimize our interventions? So this is the case that I showed you in the introduction as uh, an aesthetically driven implant placement and final solution. So the patient came to the office. We see as a dental professional different type of, I would say, concern. But what the chief complaint of the patients, mainly aesthetics or some function, chewing function. But checking the situation, we realize some incisal edge wear due to bad function. We have diastemas. We have a hopeless canine. I will focus on this uh, situation. We have missing posterior teeth on the right side. And we take attention for the lack of function. As uh, a guiding tool, this occlusal image shows us uh, certain considerations. First one, can we go flapless guided surgery? Of course, we need a CBCT. Can be utilized a socket shield? Again, CBCT. Here comes another one, which is also densification. I will explain it step by step very precisely what it means. I have to utilize connective tissue graft to improve the tissue profile on the right side. We need some crown lengthening regarding the aesthetic considerations. And finally, we have to restore the functions through the guidance. So as I always mention, planning first, CBCT. On the CBCT image, uh, we can check we have plenty of bone. We have a sick uh, gingival morphotype patient. The only problem is with the uh, bone height below the sinus floor on the right side, but I will show you more images. So we agreed that we need an implant system with good handling, primary stability, good prosthetic solution, and a nice surface technology. So why should we go digital when it's possible? Because we have to or should determine the implant position according to the bone volume, but we have to visualize prosthetically the final solution. So uh, flapless approach can be uh, done easily or safely, I would say yes. But the problem, as I mentioned, we have only eight millimeter of bone below the sinus floor, and in the posterior dentition, I would place a 10 millimeter implant. So we need some extra bony um, volume. So what can be done? <clears throat> I utilize the guided surgery uh, tool and it's a very important, at least in my practice. This is a new uh, consideration, a new kit. We call it also densification. Also densification is uh, in my office since, uh, I would say, for four or five years. And I would say it prevents a lot of time and can avoid a lot of uh, mm, invasive procedures regarding the sinus lift. So in this case, I will show you how it works as a crestal approach. This work kit can be used in any kind of implant system, and it can be used in two directions. If you use it in a normal direction, 
uh, it's a cutting. If you do it counterclockwise, it condenses the bore. We know that we have different types, different qualities of bone. Most of the time, with the upper posterior um, portion of the mouse, we face with type 4 or type 3. And to have good primary uh, stability, we need a good bone quality and quantity. We know I don't want to waste your time. The uh, success comes from two directions, the primary stability and the secondary stability. But uh, when we consider uh, the primary stability, there are two factors that is very important. Uh, the first one is the implant is it itself with good micro and macro design and the bone quality and quantity. In this specific patients, we have good quantity of bone. We need to increase the quality. What can be done? We utilize the Denzaber kit because we can densify the bone. And as an additional benefit, it's uh, a kind of auto grafting procedure. How? It condenses the bone, not only the sides, but it condenses the bone up to the apex. So when you use this burr in a counterclockwise position, I will show you a clinical video, we can increase the quality of the bone and we can gain more bone typically to the implant as a sinus lift procedure. So we increase the primary stability and it's an auto grafting procedure. They come with different diameters, and as I told you, it's independent from any implant system. So you can use it with any kind of implants that you have in your office. So we try to increase the primary stability and the magic number is 70, as I told you. And uh, as I uh, try to emphasize, uh, the guided surgery can be more safe for us and for the patient. So we planned properly on the CBCT. These are the implants we try or we will use in this patient. But here comes the video. First, so this was the hopeless canine. First, I removed the content of the uh, root canal. Then I dissect the tooth from mesial the distance, uh, distal. So this part is freehand at the time. So I didn't use the guide so far. Very gently, I remove the, uh, the palatal portion and only the shield is left attached to the cortical plate. Just check it right up to the apex. Now I shape the shield. It means that I make it thinner and cut back to crest level. Then comes the, uh, the um, surgical guide. And in a predetermined position, I make my osteotomy and will place the implant. I measure it has a very nice primary stability, so I will keep going on the right side. This is the implant position. On the right side, through the guide, flapless approach, I made my first osteotomies. The video is a little bit slows down, so hopefully you can enjoy it. If not, I will. Uh, skip, but now it works. So I make, made my first osteotomies, and then I will switch for the uh, osteodensification kit. So it gives us the safety for the proper implant position, even if we don't raise the flap. So this is densification burr kit. As you see, it's counterclockwise position with slight irrigation, and we use a kind of slight pumping motion because we don't want to tear the snyderium membrane. We just compress the autologous bone of the patients into the sinus without 
tearing without fracturing the Snyderian membrane. And now we are able to place the implant, 10 millimeter implants into the 8 millimeter heights of bone. I placed three implants. I will measure it. And it's not a magic, but you will see that even in upper ear dentition, utilizing the osseodensification approach, we can measure even 80 on the ISQ scale. So the only place that I utilized some bone grafting, bone filler material, which is a xenograft, and this was the only suture that I utilized with this operation. So it's a flatless approach. Exactly the same position as we determined at the planning stage. It was a socket shield approach, actually a guided socket shield with a good palatal position. And this is two weeks of healing when I removed that only that, that one stitch. This is the implant uh, position three dimensionally. And in this control, uh, image, you can see that there's a wisdom tooth slightly uh, touching the posterior implants. It's not by mistake. I just kept the tooth due to occlusal consideration. I will remove it, so it's hopeless. We don't need that one. But I will show you what we gained through the osteodensification. Initially, we had only 8 millimeter of bone. Now we placed 10 millimeter of implants and we gained some one and a half to two millimeter above the top of the implants. So the shield and the CBCT clearly visible, it protects the cortical plate at the side of the canine. But when we got to the point to remove the wisdom tooth, in the same procedure, I harvested a tuberosity graft from the same site, why? because we need to gain more tissue uh, buccally on the right side. But as we placed the implant uh, previously, and I didn't want to raise a flap totally, I just prepped the pouch, we called it the VISTA technique. VISTA stands for Vestibular Incision Subperiostal Approach, so it's like a tunnel. So I just prepped it, pulled that tuberosity graft inside and only one stitch and it's closed and heals very nicely. So how about the aesthetics? We plan to uh, restore the proper positions. It requires some osteotomy and crown lengthening procedure, but after some uh, healing, we have this situation, it's time for implant uh, um, impression taking. Uh, minimal invasive preps, all in enamel, with the impression copings, digital planning. These are the pressed ceramic restorations and hybrid crowns, screw detained on the implants. So it's very nice and delicate ceramic work. This is how we started. This is the uh, planning stage. And this is how we ended up utilizing multiple implants. And we improved the uh, appearance of the patients. It's very nice and pleasing. But on the occlusal view, we had this initial situation and considerations. But now you can check. We placed multiple implants with a flapless approach. We utilized connective tissue graft at the right uh, tooth number four. No any dimension change at the side of the socket shield. So we improved the function, improved the aesthetics. It's very nice and minimal invasive way of restoring uh, quite challenging and complex situation. Before and after, and this is the smile, it fits properly. We left some gap intentionally between the two centrals because it was the situation initially. We just closed it a little bit, but didn't want to uh, dis make it disappear totally. So now at this point, I want to say thank you to my uh, ceramist partner, Anta Schwardi, who provides me all the time this beautiful 
uh, ceramics. And as a final thought, we have to understand that these patients are paying for their dreams and their dreams are priceless. So as a final take-home message, especially for me, it's much easier 